Hello everyone and welcome to WASP 101. I'm Andrea Rossi, the developer of WASP. Before starting the, this tutorial, I just want to show you that I've recently created a Discord channel for WASP. And what this Discord channel is, is a place where you can actually join and discuss future development of WASP, get help when you're stuck, as well as share some of your projects that you might be doing with WASP like you can see in this. So you will find the link in the description below so you're welcome to join and I hope to meet you all there and discuss uh, awesome projects based on WASP. In this tutorial that comes after a little break we are going to explore the last of the uh, constraints that are available within WASP and these constraints are the mesh constraints. And the mesh constraints as you can understand they are a constraint which works in a very similar way as the plane constraints as it's also a global constraint and what it allows you is it allows you to use meshes to constrain the growth of an aggregation and specifically we're going to be using closed meshes to constrain an aggregation to grow either inside only a mesh or outside of it. Let's get started. If you download the Rhino file that you will find in the description below in the link, in the Google Drive link, you will find a file that uh, contains fundamentally three elements. So we have one part that is a regular um, rhombic dodecahedron. And then you will find two meshes that are going to be the meshes that we're going to use as constraints. So before starting to create the mesh constraints, we have to, as you already all know very well, start to create um, the part itself and uh, it's gonna be a little bit tricky because it's quite a lot of connections but let's just do it. We start by creating a geometry component where we're gonna store the geometry of our part and so we're gonna right click set multiple geometries and select our rhombic to the cadron and press enter to get it in and then we can also select it and hide it with the light bulb so that we have just the rhino file. Now we're going to get our point component and we're going to start selecting all points and what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to select first the top, the centers of the top rhombuses, then the centers of the mid one and then the centers of the bottom. And then so I'm going to right click, set multiple points and start doing one, two, three, four. And then I'm going to go low here, so one, two, three and four. And then I'm going to the bottom, I'm going to do one, two, three, and four. And right click to accept. Now, of course, I probably don't remember the exact order I've done, but as you know already, we can just create a point list component. Connect it, and maybe give it a size of, let's say, one. Oh, that's huge. Let's say 0 0.5. And now we have numbers that show us the order and we can use those numbers to select the um, directions of each connection. So we're going to create a curve component where we're going to right click, set multiple curves and then I'm just going to follow my number. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, 9, 10 and 11 and right click to accept. Now the order is not super important, you can just use another order as soon as the order of the curves and the points is the same because each face will be allowed to connect with every other face. Great, now that we have our um, our elements together we can start building our, our wasp part. Let me just get wasp which ended up down here. And so we're going to start by bringing a connection from direction to create our connections and that's going to be our geometry, our points and our directions. And that's going to create our lovely planes there. And then we're going to go to parts and get a basic part. As we already saw in the plane components, uh, mesh constraints are global constraints so they're set at the level of the aggregation and not at the level of the part and that means that we can use a basic part and we don't need to use the advanced part. Now we are going to give a name to our part and if it's a dodecahedron I'm going to call it dod. As always you can give any name as long as you're consistent. I'm going to connect my geometry and I'm going to connect my connections. And there you go I have my dod part. Now we move on 
and we're gonna start by creating a um, stochastic aggregation. So as always, you could do everything with field-driven aggregations. I just use the stochastic aggregation to keep it a little bit simpler. So we're gonna bring a stochastic aggregation. And so our part is gonna be our part, of course. And then we're gonna specify the number and I'm gonna say that I want 150. And then for the rules, we are just gonna go to rules and get a rule generator. If you want to know more how this works, you can just go back in the previous tutorials and see there's a, spe there's a tutorial specific on the rule generator. And I'm going to connect my rules. And now if I'm just going to go and get from parts, get part geometry, you see that I created a cloud of uh, parts already. So, but that's not what we wanted. So what we want to do is we want to constrain this cloud of parts to grow within this mesh. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do it in two steps. So first we're gonna create a volume, which is gonna be the inside of this curved wall. And we're gonna allow parts to grow only inside. And then we're gonna use the second box to create an opening in this wall. And we're gonna allow parts to grow only on, uh, outside. So by basically intersecting these two elements, we're gonna create a curved wall with an opening. So how to do that? So we're gonna start by creating our first element, so first filling the wall. So if we wanna create a mesh constraints, we have to go to aggregation, mesh constraints, bring it in. And so we have to specify three uh, parameters. The first one is the geometry. And to do that, we're gonna create a mesh component. Right click, set one mesh and pick our wall. And then we can also select the wall and hide it for now. And we are gonna connect it to the geometry. And then we have to specify if we wanna allow the growth inside or outside. We wanna do inside, so we're gonna create a toggle. Change it to true and place it there. And secondly, as we already saw in the plane constraints, we can specify if the constraint is soft or hard. And when it's a soft constraint, we're gonna just check the constraints against the center of the part. While instead, if we create a hard constraint, we're gonna be actually checking the geometry of the part. And so if the mesh of the part intersects this constraint. By default, we leave it on soft on true, so that we are gonna just check the center point and that's gonna allow us to compute much faster. So now that I created my constraint, I can connect it to my stochastic aggregation. And what I also wanna do is I'm gonna create a, a button to reset the aggregation. And then as you remember, if I do it now, of course nothing happens because the aggregation mode is on zero, which is no constraints. So as we wanna use global constraints, we are gonna create a slider, set it to true, and plug it into the mode. If now I reset, what happens? What happens is that the aggregation tells me that it's unable to place any parts. And the reason for that is that um, the, the first part, so the part we started from, is outside of this mesh. So if it wants to grow from this little element, any part that is gonna be placing around it, are, it's gonna be outside this constraint and so it's not gonna be able to satisfy it. And so that's the reason why the aggregation stops. If we wanna allow this to work, we have two options. One option would be to move the constraint so that this part is inside, but a smarter option is to actually create a starting part from this part that is gonna be moved somewhere inside our wall so that then the aggregation will be start growing from there. So we're gonna do that. So I'm gonna move my constraint a little bit lower. And to do that, we are gonna need to go to parts and get a component transform part. So we wanna transform our original part. And so to move it for now, we're just gonna create a move component. And we are gonna assign it a, um, a vector. So I'm gonna create a vector x, y, z. And I'm gonna create for it a slider, which is gonna be, let's say from, say minus 50, I'm gonna set it to zero, and I'm gonna set it maximum to 50. So I'm gonna create three of them, 
to create a, a slider in x, y, and z so that I can move my part in x, y, and z directions. And I'm going to connect on my vector to the T of move. And then the transformation object that is created here, I'm going to connect it to my transform part. Now to see and visualize what I'm doing, I'm going to use the uh, get part geometry, which I'm going to connect to the part out. And so of course, right now the part is not being moved. But if I start moving it using the sliders, I can actually move it and make sure that it's fully inside the element. Now I cannot see it. What I can do is I can get a face boundary component to my mesh so that I see the boundaries and then I can right click and hide the mesh component itself. So now you can see that I placed my element fully inside. And what we want to do now is we want to take this transform part and plug it into the previous input so that that's going to be a part that is already belonging to the aggregation before the aggregation algorithm starts. And so that means that the aggregation will not start from the base part anymore, but will start from this previous part. If now I reset, you see that effectively I am creating an aggregation which follows this wall. And if I start growing it, the number, you see that it fills this whole element and at some point it's gonna fail. I mean now it's failing but it's not giving you a feedback so that's strange I'm gonna have to check that. But you can see that uh, in this wall now we created a wall which contains, which is fully contained in there. We can go on and test what happens if we put the constraints from soft to hard and the reset. You probably see that the wall will become thinner as the parts are have to be fully constrained. So you can see here that now we have a much thinner wall because it's making sure that none of this is uh, fitting outside. So let's put it back to so to hard soft sorry now reset again you'll also notice then when we do it with a hard constraint the speed drastically drops and that's because it has to compute mass intersection instead of a simple point containment okay great now we have our wall but now what if we want to create a hole in our wall so the way to do that is to create a second mesh constraint so we're gonna go again to aggregation and get a mesh constraint. And it, this time as a geometry, we're gonna specify this box. Right click, set one geometry, and then I'm gonna hide it. Connect the box to the geometry. And then I'm, again, I'm gonna create my two toggles. So I'm gonna leave the in toggle to false, meaning that this constraint will allow growth just outside itself and not inside. And then I'm gonna put the soft again to true just that it's computing faster. I can again uh, use a face boundary to visualize the mesh so that I can then hide it. And what I can do is I could simply connect it, but to have a bit of order, we can use a merge component. and then could, oops, connect that to our constraint input. And if now I reset, you see that our wall keeps growing and it's growing outside. So it's growing, creating a hole. If we want to visualize this a bit better, we can maybe create a custom preview with this watch. And I can maybe change the view to wireframe so that we see the shadows a bit better. So what happens now if I go and change the second constraint to true? If I now do it and then reset, we see that once again, nothing happens. And the reason why nothing happens is because this 
constraints, so the WASP constraints for how they are built now, they, are, they have to be all satisfied in order to allow uh, a placement of a part. So that means that the only parts that are allowed to be placed are the parts that are fitting within both this element and this element at the same time. So only within the intersection between two. Now that's not super flexible and that's something that it's already fixed in the um, development version of WASP, so if you want to test that you can go on um, GitHub and get the latest version of WASP there and you will see that there you can actually set whether a constraint is required or not and so you could also have a constraint that works as a union of these two and not as an intersection. Now if I would want this to work I will have to actually go and move my part making sure that it's placed that is placed inside both elements. So you see, so here would probably work. And if now I'm gonna reset, see that it's gonna grow some of the parts in there. If I go back again and I toggle this to false again, and then reset, now that's not gonna work because I'm inside and so again I have to move my part to make sure it's outside the box but inside the wall and then reset again. So you can see how um, mesh constraints are extremely useful and extremely effective at creating very quickly uh, an aggregation that even if it's a stochastic aggregation it follows a specific geometry. Now this is a faster way to calculate uh, to fill a geometry with modules than using fields however fields allow you to also set um, a certain uh, heuristic and a certain direction to the growth so if you want to grow for example from the center of the volume to the outside. Well, instead, the uh, stochastic aggregation will be just randomly placing parts and checking whether that works. So it might actually happen in few cases that you will not be able to fill your whole volume entirely. That's it for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you want to stay updated with more WASP tutorials, just subscribe to the channel. And uh, thanks for watching, and see you in the next tutorials.